so much for, uh, for coming back. That's the first thing. Um, so the job now over the next 35 minutes or so is we'd like to share some of the research that we've been doing on people-centered transformation. The hope here is that the panel discussion created a desire in us to, to manage these tensions between optimizing the core, doing what we must, being planful, being focused, but also at the same time creating room and space and a kind of culture that allows organizations to find their new tomorrow. And so uh, that's the work that we've been doing and I'd like to share a little bit about this tension in a video that was produced in, in, in conjunction with TED for Brightline that kind of highlights the, the true tension that exists between trying to both design and deliver strategy in increasingly uncertain times. It's only two minutes, but hopefully it'll help set the context for what we're gonna talk about today. Metaphors are powerful. We used to see the universe, our societies, companies, and even our bodies as machines. The machine metaphor affected everything from how we build economies to how we treat a disease. It affects how leaders see their organizations, a hierarchical system for turning inputs into outputs, an assembly line where the plan, the strategy, the idea is handed down, and the conveyor belt churns out the desired result. While that may have been a fine machine for making cars, in a world where disruption can appear with no warning, it doesn't sound like a metaphor for success. But what if we change the metaphor? What if we moved from a rigid, mechanistic view to a more fluid, dynamic metaphor? We could see an organization not as a machine, but as an integrated system, a complex web that may seem chaotic from the outside, but contains within it the means to respond and adapt to change. The system is not walled off, but it is connected, adapting, and responding to every system around it. A system that can repair itself when disrupted. A system that gets stronger, that evolves. Research has shown us that the best teams are those that are adaptive, while still being focused on a common, greater goal. Teams that can tame chaos to discover something amazing. Just like every cell in our body contains the same set of genetic instructions, so must a successful strategy permeate the entire organization. Strategic design and delivery are the intertwined parts of those instructions, not disconnected steps. Metaphors matter. Organizations aren't machines. They are collections of people. Leaders should move beyond seeing their job as simply setting gears into motion. Instead, they should focus on balancing the health of the overall system, on adapting to changes along the way, and on connecting strategy design and delivery. So I, I think that video kind of encapsulates a little bit about what we were talking about on the panel is this tension. Tension is a positive thing, it's not necessarily a negative thing between the core and the new business, between the now and the later, between the things and the assets, and, and getting that alchemy right is a truly human thing. It's a people thing. And that's what we at Brightline are trying to explore in more detail. And why we're doing that, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd rifle through some of these reports to kind of make the case about the Project Revolution. And those of you know Antonio, um, he wrote this book, The Project Revolution. And, and if operations is about running the business, projects are about changing the business. And it, in, according to his research, at least, we're seeing a lot more change the business projects emerging. And, and hopefully this will back that up. Um, if you look at the, the work report from, put out from PMI a couple of years ago, said over the next 14 years, we're going to see a 68% increase in project-oriented work activity. That more and more work is going to be conducted in projects. Um, if you look at the Navigating Complexity report also put out by PMI, those projects are actually becoming highly complex. So to, as of that report two years ago, 41% of projects were highly complex. So, so they were becoming bigger budgets, higher, uh, higher uh, failure if, if we risked, if, 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 we, if we didn't deliver on them. Not only that, they're becoming more strategic. So, so most executives, this was the, state, the Pulse of the Profession report, say that 50% of their organization's projects are now strategic. The other issue is that 28% of them are failing outright. That's more than a quarter. So those projects that are becoming more complex, that are more strategic, are not delivering uh, the results that we need. 
And so that means we're spending a lot of money, we're wasting a lot of money due to ineffective implementation. I think Ricardo points out that this is uh, equivalent to the GDP of his home country, Brazil. So a lot of money being wasted in driving projects towards strategic outcomes in highly complex environments with not as much success as we'd like. 88% of CEOs uh, in an EIU report say successfully executing projects is, more is the most important area of strategy implementation. Unfortunately, 59% of them admit that they struggle to bridge this gap between strategy, design, delivery. Uh, they do say that 81% of organizations rank leadership skills as most important. I think Carolyn would probably agree with that. Uh, and, and then cultural attitudes are identified as the number one barrier to getting it done. So at the end of the day, as I, as I think Rick said on the panel, it's, it's about the people. All of these charts will be made available, by the way. You're more than happy to, to snap at them, but um, we'll make, they're all will be made available to you should you want them. So um, the People Manifesto, you have a copy of this. There's, there's a couple of things that you have. The purple book on your table is a, a new publication from Brightline that looks at this whole notion of transformation with some great thought and practice leaders and their insights, many of whom were up here at the panel. And then secondly, I'd like to draw your attention to this particular artifact here called the People Manifesto, which was where I first had the great opportunity of connecting with Brightline. And the idea here is how do we, how do we actually get under the covers to understand what it is we have to do more, better, or differently, or what are the next practices that we need to employ to both run the business and change the business effectively and tap into the ingenuity of people so that we can sustain the business in increasingly transient times. And so, if you look at the, at the opening remarks there, people, from, people form the link between strategy, design, and delivery. They're the entity that turn ideas into reality, and more importantly, they put the strategy in motion. As Rick, kept, as Rick said, and as Charles Handy has said before, organizations are nothing without people, and people make the organization stop or go. So um, this research that I'm about to share with you is actually Brightline, uh, I'm sorry, a Dialogue has, has thankfully made available online. So if you like what you hear today, you can go online and you can access this content today. They've made it available online. The article, I think, doesn't come out till December 4th, Ben, is that right? In the, in the actual magazine, but it's now available online. Oh. Oh, this magazine. Oh, perfect. Okay, wonderful. When, well, thank you for that. We appreciate it. So, so um, what my task was over the last five or six months is to begin to begin a research inquiry into this People Manifesto and dig into it a little bit more. And I've done that. Very, very preliminary. You're the first people seeing it, apart from what's going to come out in the article. And, uh, and here's the answer. You'll notice it's not linear. <laughs> it's interconnected and it's, it's, it's a web. And so we're taking a, a biological metaphor, an elemental metaphor, that says there, the first thing is you can't necessarily change a culture, but you can nudge it. You shouldn't leave a culture to chance because left to its own devices, it'll calcify around the status quo. But what you should be doing is trying to nudge it in the direction of aspiration, tapping into the people's uh, desires, uh, purpose-led organizations is a big topic today. And that if you do that, people will find meaning in that aspiration and find less trouble aligning around that aspiration and unlock their discretionary effort. Now, if you are successful in doing that, the next challenge, though, is that means you have to let go. You have to give those people autonomy to find uh, vehicles for that energy that they've created so that they can go and do stuff. And in giving them autonomy, you also then say you have accountability for delivering. And these four things are very easy to say, but incredibly hard to do in practice. And so the idea is every action you take in, in interacting within one of these elements of this particular performance center transformation frame is that you almost have to do the opposite of what you've traditionally done. You have to ask yourself the question, am I, doing, am I engaging in the right way as a leader in order to drive the outcome I'm looking for to nudge the culture forward? And the way we're going to do this is, for each element, what I've done is I've broken it down into head, heart, and hands. Starting first with heart, where I've taken an inspiring quote or a piece of research from a practice or thought leader. Secondly, I've got the facts. You don't get the facts till later. I've got the facts here put into packets. That's my incentive to have you come back and work on a particular area. And then thirdly, the uh, Agile Alliance is, is part of the Brightline group. And we've really leaned in heavily to their experience in driving change in Agile and software. And if you ever read the Agile Manifesto, 
they always begin with a set of values. We have come to value x over y. So for instance, they have come to value individuals over process. So one of the reasons they believe they were successful is that they've adopted these x over y principles that they believe have helped them be more successful in driving agile software development. And as I hope you'll see, we have borrowed heavily from that in putting together this work. So the first thing is insights from practice and thought leaders. The second thing which you'll get after the break is data from reports and research papers. And then the third is values-based behaviors to motivate change. So the way this is going to work is I'm now gonna go into rapid speak and talk about what the research has shown. And then I'm gonna ask you to honestly and authentically score your organization on each of these elements. And that'll become important because later, I'm gonna ask you to take your highest score and your lowest score and map it on the poster over there, okay? And um, if in doubt, please don't choose the middle. Go left or right, meaning, you know, don't, don't just choose neither. Is there anybody who doesn't have the PCT Pulse? Do you want one? Anyone else need one? Ah, oh, number, okay, let me, get, let me hand a few more. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna let self-organization happen, and you'll pass these around, and by the time, anyone on that side needs them? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, yep, they're coming, they're coming. Is I'm gonna go through each one of these. I'm gonna explain a little bit about where it came from, and then I'm going to ask you to score after I've demonstrated some of the values. What I want to emphasize here, because I have done a dry run on this, is I am not suggesting that managing the core business should be thrown away. What I'm suggesting is if you're trying to push to the edge and you're trying to nudge the culture forward, these are some things you might want to value in order to do so. So we're assuming that running the core business efficiently and effectively is the current state. And what we're having to do is try to nudge the culture outside of that zone. Does that make sense? Okay. So, the first one. Martin Luther King did not say, I have a plan. Because if he said, I had a plan, we wouldn't be talking about him today. He had a dream. And he was very articulate in that dream. And what we know about human behavior is, People have to believe in the achievement of a shared aspiration. And that they have to believe that it's possible and worthy of their effort to make that happen. That's a prerequisite to having people change their behavior, is that they have to have a shared belief. I don't know a lot of people who have shared belief in plans, but they do have shared belief in aspiration, in dreams, in shared endeavor. And so the first piece of the equation is you have to com communicate a compelling change narrative. People need to know why, to quote Simon Sinek. So if that's true, as leaders, we have to, borrowing again from the Agile Alliance, do the following. We have to value the shared aspiration over the required action. We have to value the possible future over the problematic present, and we have to value the purposeful why over the actionable what and how. Again, going from the core to the edge, borrowing from our friends at Agile Alliance, this is what we have to value if what we're trying to do is nudge the culture in the direction of aspiration, alignment, autonomy, and accountability. So, question number one. On your survey, please rate your organization on the following. Our leaders communicate a clear, concise, and consistent and compelling narrative that makes a purposeful, passionate, and emotionally resonant case for change. And when I say leaders, I mean leaders. The first line leader all the way up to the executive. I think of leadership as a system. How strongly would you rate your organization on that? Do 
give you one more minute. We have to move down the learning curve, then we can move quickly. But all of these assets will be made available afterwards, so, and if, so feel free to jot it down on the actual sheet. OK, are we OK on that? Item number two. Gandhi said, you have to be the change you wish to see in the world. And if you look at Hermania Abara's research, she argues that leaders who deliberately act their way into a new way of thinking, rather than thinking their way into a new way of acting, are more successful not only in changing their own behavior, but motivating change behavior in others. So if we need to be the change we want to see, there's a couple of things we have to start to value. Number one, we have to demonstrate change behavior over demanding change behavior. As a parent, this is a pretty hard one. When my kid says, stop watching TV, and my <laughs> or when I say to my kid, stop watching TV, and my kid says, well, you watch TV all the time, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so what we say speaks far more loudly and eloquently than what we, or what we do fe fe speaks far more loudly and eloquently than what we say. So how can we actually expect somebody to change their behavior in a, in a different direction if we don't model it ourselves? I think Carolyn mentioned that in, in her research too. We have to uh, be authentic and open over being authoritarian and overbearing. I don't know the answer. We have to figure it out. But wait, they'll think I'm weak. We have to try and learn over think and plan. We have to value trying and learning over thinking and planning. So in order to act and think differently, I'd like you to score your organization on the following. Our leaders generate respect and followership from others by personally, authentically, and openly modeling the change beliefs and behaviors required to evolve the organization. How well do your leaders act to think differently? Are we down the curve now? Again, I'm talking about moving from core business out. These are the non-obvious ways we, as a leadership system, might have to behave by having different values in order to move the needle. Next, embrace situational humility. This is Mary Parker Follett, and she wrote this in 1922, I believe. Leadership is not defined by the exercise of power, but by the capacity to increase the sense of power among those led. Different framing on power. We tend to think about position, reward, and coercive power as the kind of way we drive organizational change, which was something we talked about earlier. Um, what we know from Amy Emerson's work is that leaders have to embrace situational humility. We don't know all the answers. If we claim to know all the answers, we're being inauthentic, particularly in the world we live in today. So instead, we should show vulnerability, we should seek help, we should ask questions, and we should demonstrate that failure is acceptable, something I know that was talked about here in the panel. So humility builds a foundation of trust and psychological safety that gives others the confidence to engage in open, transparent, and authentic interactions around the change. I think Mar Martin talked about this, that we don't impose change on people. We want act people to be motivated to engage around change. If we don't create the milieu within which they can openly and authentically talk about it, how can we expect them to want to adopt it? So the values we have to think about here are showing vulnerability over projecting power, asking questions over mandating direction, making failure safe over playing it safe. If what we're trying to do is nudge the culture towards aspiration, alignment, autonomy, and accountability so that the organization can be more nimble, more flexible, act more like an organism. These are some of the things we have to think about to nudge it in that direction. So again, for your organization, please rank the following. Our leaders show vulnerability, seek help, demonstrate that failure is acceptable, and consistently seek to increase the autonomy and accountability of others. How well is your organization doing on that scale? OK. 
Okay? We're down the curve now, so I'm just going to keep going. Steve Jobs, famously, when he came back to Apple, um, drew a two by two on the board and said there's consumer and there's enterprise and there's laptop and there's PC. In that, he killed a number of projects that his very good friends were part of. He even killed a project named after his own daughter, the Apple Lisa. And so his argument is that focus is not about saying yes, it's about saying no. To reduce collaborative over overload, this is Rob Cross's research, leaders must adopt a portfolio-based approach to change by ensuring that people's energy and attention is squarely focused on the vital few change initiatives that matter most. Otherwise, we tend to over-collaborate, stretch ourselves too thin, and suffer from change fatigue. In order to do this, we have to value saying no over letting it go. We know that we let too many projects go for too long. We have to be more disciplined in saying no sooner. Rootless prioritization over holding options. Not saying we never hold options, but are we holding on to options too long just because we don't want to get it wrong? We don't want to fail. And then another big thing is Daniel Goleman's la latest research is that time isn't the variable, focused attention is the variable that matters most. So are we really focusing attention over just simply measuring action? Those are three things we might want to value as leaders in organizations if we're trying to nudge the culture forward. So, for your organization, our leaders bring clarity and focus by prioritizing and communicating the key strategic priorities that matter most to the business. How well does your organization score on that particular variable? Halfway there, almost halfway there. Next, motivate discretionary effort. Uh, this gentleman may not be familiar to a lot of you. His name is Vince Lombardi. He is a very well-known uh, football coach, American football coach. I know it shouldn't be called football, uh, but that's a different story for a different day. Uh, his quote here is that individual commitment to a group effort is what makes a team work, it's what makes a company work, and it's what makes a society work. And so what we know is we have to unlock the discretionary effort of people. And those, we, that we do that not through extrinsic levers, but through intrinsic ones. Discretionary effort is that magical fuel where people do things that they're not told to. They do it because they want to, because they believe it's the right thing to do. We see this a lot in crises. Uh, Brightline brought out a really nice paper on why is it that when we are in an emergency situation, people tend to just automatically operate at a different level. And the argument is because they have a shared sense of purpose, that lives are at stake, and that they will work with and through each other to address those challenges. So we have to look at the intrinsic motiv motivational levers that compel people to go the extra mile. And we do that by tapping into their aspirations and giving them autonomy in return for accountability. We have to know what motivates them and then make sure that they find meaning in the work of the enterprise and make that forge that connection through a motivational aspect, not through a fear aspect. So what do we have to value if we want to motivate discretionary effort, if we want to unlock this fuel source inside the enterprise? One, we have to look at channeling aspiration over mandating direction. Secondly, we have to motivate inspiration over manipulating with fear. And thirdly, we have to value recognizing effort, even if it fails, over requiring conformity. Again, these are the baselines, but the other side is where we have to stretch to. So for number five, how well do you rate on the following? Our leaders understand how to motivate discretionary effort by tapping into the aspirations of others and giving them the autonomy in return for accountability to achieve it. How well do your leaders do that today? Number six. Agency is a two-way street. Power comes with responsibility and accountability. This is um, Charlene Lee's most recent research. Organizations that give people agency, which she defines as the permission to take independent action or make changes without approval, are far more likely to succeed in organization transformation. What we find is that the decision-making cycle gets gets really, really slow in organizations if there's too much centralized command and control 
And that doesn't allow the, that it creates too much inertia for the organization to be able to adapt as fast as it needs to. So if we really are going to give others agency and people, leaders have a hard time with this, uh, they have to value give and take reciprocity over top-down hierarchy. And that's hard if you're at the top of the hierarchy. They have to value encouraging independent action over requiring prior permission. And they have to value giving agency over exercising authority. So next test, number six. Our leaders create agency by giving others the permission to take independent actions and make changes without hierarchical approval. How does your organization fare in that particular element? We're in the home stretch now. Number seven. It's the Peter Drucker form. We can't not quote Peter Drucker. Um, and so, one of my favorite. In most organizations, the bottleneck is at the top of the bottle. Evidence? So uh, Roger Martin, who I think has written something in this particular, if not in this one, in the, in the prior book that was put out by Brightline, he envisions organizations as decision factories. And he argues that leaders should only make the choices they are best equipped to make and pass the others along. So if you think about organizations as decision factories, and then you think about speed of decision making as a variable that matters, maybe one of those leading variables that uh, Rita was talking about earlier on, we might have to kind of come to value some different things. For instance, we might want to value a person's experience and expertise over their position and role when we're dealing with a particular complex situation that we don't know much about. Uh, some interesting experiments I ran many years ago is I would put people into a virtual reality environment where they would not know who the leaders were. I would mask their voices and I would give a set of decisions. And then I would run it in the real world where we knew what the hierarchical structure was. It's very interesting, but those decisions were quite different. And the ones where we didn't know who was in charge ended up being better decisions. If we are going to make decisions, it's really important that we explain the rationale for those decisions rather than just expecting agreement. We might think they're the most wonderful choice that we've ever made strategically, but unless the people understand the why behind it and the rationale, we can't just expect them to blindly take it and expect agreement with it. We need to give them the space to have a conversation. And the last thing is we've got to cascade decisions over centralizing them because if we centralize them, we sink into the vortex. There's ample research that shows that if, you know, <laughs> the simple question you can ask in an organizational network analysis is, if I had access, if I had more access to this person, I would be a lot more productive in my work. And when you do that work, Rob Cross has done this work, Steve Garcia has done this work, it's all about the leaders. It's all about the leaders who aren't willing to let go of control and decision making, and they actually slow down the flow of decision making within the organization. Okay, how well does your organization or do your leaders only make the choices they are best equipped to make, clarify the choices others have to make, and the boundaries within which to make them? How strong is your decision cascade in your organization today? Are we okay? Next one. This is John Cotter. Uh, John's well known for his work on the eight steps of change, but most recently his work has been focused on something he calls Accelerate. And his argument today is, is very similar, I think, to what was discussed here on the panel, is that we kind of, we have to run a dual operating system in our organizations. On the one side, we need the hierarchy that is maximized for efficiency and profit in the core business. But on the other, we need some kind of network, some kind of ecosystem, some kind of uh, non-hierarchical uh, re social relationship type structure that can allow us to find the new tomorrow. And so leaders have to exercise their position, power, and influence to override the traditional hierarchy, because that's the basic model, 
and create the time and space for cross-functional teams to emerge, converge, and engage around critical strategy design delivery interfaces. So here, the very people who are within the hierarchy have to actually create air cover to allow room for teams to emerge and converge, rather than just appointing them, allowing the time and space for that autonomous unit to emerge and say, we feel we have an answer to this particular challenge that we don't know the answer to, but we, we feel that we can go out and, and test and learn on that. Will you give us the cover to do so outside the hierarchy? Now, to do that as leaders, you have to catalyze the network. And if you're going to catalyze the network, you have to value things like informal networks over organization hierarchies. You have to value things like organizational network analysis over organization restructuring. Organization restructuring is kind of, uh, companies suffer from something I call responses, responsiveness lag. It's like we come in, most, or, most senior executives within three years will reorg the company because it's a tangible structural lever that they can drive. And they say, yep, we're reorganizing and we're gonna reorganize around whatever go to market or we're going to product or something like that. Meanwhile, they don't realize, as Michael's point, is they were in an ecosystem. And by the time they're done restructuring and they try to harden that structure, the, the landscape has evolved to where they need to move again. And so why do we spend so much time with that when what we could be doing is kind of tapping into the discretionary effort of people and allowing them to go where they're motivated to make change within this new e ecosystem landscape? And so therefore, we need to create the space for emergent collaborative teaming, self-organized, as opposed to assigned cross-functional teams. We need someone from IT, someone from HR, someone from blah, 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 to get in here and solve the problem. So we're assuming through functional representation that we might solve a problem, when what we're really looking for is motivation. How many of us have been on a cross-functional team that we think totally sucks? Nobody's raised their hand. Two people have raised their hand. If I ask people in organizations, they all put up their hand and say, it's over collaboration, I'm asked to go to too many of these meetings, it doesn't, it's not worth a hill of beans, and I'm only here because I'm in, from HR, or IT, or insert shared service here. So, number eight, our leaders create the time and space for cross-functional teams to emerge, converge, and engage around crucial strategy design delivery interfaces. Where do you get the time and space to address things that really matter to the organization that they haven't figured out yet. Two more, two more. Next, Peter Senge. Uh, Peter obviously has done a lot of work in learning organizations, but most recently he's been looking at systems leadership and so his argument is real change starts with recognizing we're part of the systems we seek to change. We're not outside of it. There's this thing called leadership attribution error, uh, uh, Kellerman talks about, where we tend to kind of attribute everything to the leader. And it's clear, Rick is a fantastic leader, but I think he'd be the first to say it's not all him. In fact, that came up in the panel. And so as leaders, we're not outside of the change, we're actually part of the change. Therefore, leadership, like everything else, is a system. And so Peter believes that we need a new kind of leader, a systems leader, to catalyze the collaborative leadership required to successfully navigate dynamic and complex systemic change. That if, if we're dealing with a system, we have to operate as a system, not as a linear hierarchy. If we're gonna do that to lead the system, we've gotta think about systemic collective leadership over functional hierarchical leadership, We've got to think about catalyzing and guiding change over controlling and monitoring compliance. And we've got to think about adaptive leadership systems over technical leadership practices. So that's lead the system. How well do your leaders catalyze the collaborative leadership required to successfully navigate dynamic, complex, and systemic change? We always save the best for last, and so the last is about nudging the culture. Culture is famously intractable, and very difficult to address, um, but we also know we can't leave it up to chance. I had the, uh, I was about to say good fortune, I'm not sure if it's good fortune or not, but I lived through IBM's transformation when, when Lou Gerstner was there, and when Lou was done with that transformation, he wrote a book, and that book was called Teaching the Elephant How to Dance. 
And the book was largely about culture. And in that, he said, I came to see in my time at IBM, culture isn't just one aspect of the game, it's the game. And the reason it's the game is because culture can be a limiting and restrictive force to the design and delivery of a strategic change initiative. And while culture itself is really hard to change, we know we can't leave it to chance because otherwise it, it kind of it, it kind of regresses to the status quo. So if we're going to nudge the culture, we have to really lean into the human and emotional side of the change rather than just the technical rational one. Technical rational one's easy. We can point to it. We've changed the process. We've implemented a structure. We're making progress. But what does that mean for the human beings, which is the whole purpose for this conversation? We have to focus on each element of the people-centered transf transformation model rather than saying, let's change the culture. You can't go directly at culture. You have to go at the antecedents of culture and nudge it in the direction you want it to go. And then, stealing my own thunder, you have to nudge the culture over leaving it to chance. So the final question for your organization, our leaders consciously and continuously nudge the culture in the direction of aspiration, alignment, autonomy, and accountability. How well are you doing on that? All right, I had to take my jacket off now because we're, uh, we're about to have 50 human beings stand up and do something, and I'm, I may have to run out of the room, okay, because it's always dangerous. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to look at your scores, okay? And wherever you've scored lowest, I want you to circle that one, meaning mo mo more to the left. And wherever you've scored highest, I want you to circle that one. So you should have two, well, if you have two that you've scored low or two that you've scored high, I want you for now to pick a tiebreaker. I want you to pick the one that you think deserves more attention. Got it? So you would have one that you would claim your organization does well, meaning you're leaning towards strongly agree, and you have one that perhaps you don't do as well on, leaning towards strongly disagree. Let me see, is there anybody who does not have two circles on their sheet? Great. Now, here's the hard part, or the easy part. Up here, we have the PCT map. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to come up. You get one green <coughs> sticky. What's that for? Yeah, that's for the good one. And if you think you're good, you put that on the left side of the particular element. Does that make sense? And Similarly, for the one that you don't think you're great at, you put it on the right side. And I'm going to say, <laughs> go. And then you're all going to magically stand up. And within the next three minutes, we'll have a collective picture of our people-centered transformation pulse. Wait, is there anything I didn't give in my directions that's, that I should have so that this will happen flawlessly? Because I'm not, as Martin Reeves knows, the most organized person in the world. Is it clear? You should have a high and a low. Yes? Repeat it. It's always good to repeat. If for your highest score, take green and put it on the left-hand side of the element that you scored highest. For your lowest score, take red and put it on the right-hand side of the element. And don't forget, nudge the culture is up here. Are we up to this challenge? It's the hardest thing we'll have to do all day. On your marks, get set, go. Stickers are up there. Left side for positive, right side for opportunity. Oh, this will point legislative decision makers if you somehow yeah. have all the answers. Yeah. And we're just completely rebelling. Mm -hmm. And so it would be interesting to send.
send him a copy of this and say, why don't you, why don't oh, yeah. you rank this? Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Nice job, Tony. Yeah, yeah, nice job. Do you have any extras of these, um, of these surveys? Okay. Okay, great. It's a continuum. The core is where you're at. The question is, if you just stay there, you'll just be there. So, does that make sense? Yes, it's it a does. stretch. Not a, it's not saying you're going to gain. It's going mm -hmm. up. Right. It's where you move. Yep. Has everybody voted? Yes? I'm going to bring my little handy dandy worksheet over here then. So, how are we doing? What do people see? Any thoughts? Anybody? This group can't see, so let me uh, pull this over here a little further. It, lo it looks like if we just count numbers, decentralizing decision making seems to be a little bit of a both. Some people say they're doing it well, even number. Eight, uh, four say they're doing it well, four say not so much. One person can't follow directions. I'm just kidding. I'm Irish. It's humor, but should be over here, okay? It's a rubric. It's a real. I, I sh it's it, it's actually a poor template. I labored last night with coloring one side green and one side red. Yeah. So this is the person we should actually hire because they're the outlier, right? We shouldn't. Everybody else. Yeah. 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 Posit we call that positive deviance. We want to look for the positive deviance in our organization. So I think that there's some energy around de uh, decentralizing decision making. Uh, it looks like there's a little bit of energy about embracing situation humility, which means get over yourself as a leader, own your vulnerability, those kind of things. Um, and then giving others agency. So I'm going to take those three, and then I'm going to take catalyze the network, because there's a lot of people saying, what the heck is that? And there's two people who say, oh, I know. So we'll, we'll use that one as well. And then focus on the few, which is this challenge of, how can I, at one side of the equation, be we, this is what we really have to focus on for change, but then it changes. I think the idea here is you have to make as few of those changes as possible, and you have to focus on as few things as possible. Otherwise, as Rob Cross has shown, we get into collaborative overload. So what I'm going to suggest is that we do this one, this one, this one, this one, and... Anyone got real strength of wanting to go for another one? This is your chance. Anyone? 
All right, I'm going to say embrace situational humility. So what I'd like us to do now is give others agency, which is number six. Let me do this. There. So now you have a map. Number six is give others agency. I want people to convene in this part of the room. Okay? A a another human task. I, I appreciate you going with me. We can't move the tables, so we have to move the people. Yeah? There's a lesson in that. So number six, give others agency. If you're interested in having a conversation about that, move to this part of the room. Number three, embrace situational humility. I want you to move into this area of the room. Make sense? Number, so I've done that one, I've done that one. Number four, focus on the few. I want you to just convene in the middle front area there. And number seven, decentralized decision making. I'd like you to convene over on that side. And last but not least, number eight, is it? Catalyze the network. I'd like you to convene over here. Now, why do I want you to do this? I'll tell you why. Because I've got little packets for you that share the research about what we know. And also, we have people who have ideas that they could share. So I have, I have goodies to give out. But the first thing I need is for you to organize. And when you're all, like, I'll say I'm in group six or I'm in group three, I want you all to raise your hand when you've, when you've gathered. Does that make sense? Are we up for that task? Should I repeat that? Here's the map and where I'd like you to get together. When you're all done and you say, I'm here for agency or I'm here for network, I want you all to raise your hands. That way I know everybody has self-organized into the part of the room that makes sense for them. Are we ready? On your marks, get set, go. When you've gathered, I want you to raise your hands just so I know that we've got the group. Six is give others agency. Uh, three is in this area here. Six, just go to that end there and three will organize here. You got to go to the edge. It's all about being on the edge. Oh, no, no, sorry, sorry. I'm wrong. Six is where they should be. Three should be there. Okay. I actually drew it backwards. I apologize. You get, hands up. <laughs> You're three. This group. Six. Six. We got three. We got three people who are interested in. Okay. Over here. Seven. And this group. This group. Eight, okay. All right. This group? You're three with these people. You have to climb over the table. Oh, you? Four? Oh, focus on a few. Got it. All right, can I have your attention? There's two ways we can do this. We could just let you discuss, but I'd like to, shh, if I may, I'd like to bring a little bit of structure to this. Okay, so what I'd like you to do in your teams is I'd like you to point in the air. Point, point in the air. Okay? Group six, you're not pointing in the air. Or group three. Group three, point in the air. Point in the air, yeah. What, what one are they working on? They're working on embracing situational humility over there. Okay, is everybody pointing in the air? All right, here's your task. I want you to, as quickly and deliberately as possible, point to your leader. Go. <laughs> All right. Do we have leaders? Let me see. Show of hands. Is there a leader? We have a leader. A reluctant leader, but we have a leader. We have a leader? Do we have a leader? 
Everyone? Okay. So leaders, your job is to come up and tell me what your topic is, and I will hand you a packet. Okay? Leaders, come on up and tell me what group you're in, and I will hand you a packet. Decentralized decision making. It's a fun one. Oh, Goldie, how are you? Good to see you. We have to chat. Yes. Yeah? Yes. You have another one? Yes. Good, good, good. Number eight is catalyze the network. Yes. Yeah. Catalyze the network. And oh, oh, can't let you go without your tools of the trade. All right. Does everybody have a leader, a sheet? and some of the research. All right, leaders, here's the task. And I'm going to give you some times here. Here we go. We've already selected the PCT element to work on. We've assigned a leader. So what I'd like you to do is you have packets that I've handed out that kind of give you the quote, give you a little bit of research. Individually, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to jot down what you think, before you start talking, this is a nominal group technique, I want you to quietly and individually jot down what I think we need to do more, better, or differently to nudge this element forward, and any next practices you're aware of. So what I'd like to do is channel Simon and Garfunkel, sound of silence. I'm going to give us four minutes of silence to review the material and write down individually what we think we might do more, better, differently. Then, leaders, it's your chance to shine. You will then be tasked with synthesizing that and putting it onto the template. So what do we collectively think about more, better, differently, and next practices? And just to add some pressure, leaders, you then have to give us a two-minute readout so everybody can learn from everybody else. But because you're the leader, you can delegate that responsibility should you choose to. Is it clear? Four minutes, quietly review the packets, think independently about what you want to do more, better, differently, and what the next practices are, and then it'll be up to the leaders to synthesize. Your time starts now. Individually, take a look at the material. What do you have to do more, better, differently, and next practices? Go.
Okay, for you extroverts who are exploding to want to talk, we have about 90 more seconds and then we will let it rip. Okay, leaders, your task now over the next seven minutes is to hear from the group and see what we collectively agree or something somebody thinks is a good idea and capture it on your template here. That's why I gave you the Sharpie, is to kind of capture the, the wisdom of the group, if you will, around what you have to do more, better, or differently with respect to that element and any next practices that organizations have found successful. And then you can either prepare or delegate a two-minute readout of what we did. And it, it'll be just that, more, better, differently, and next practices. Are you ready? Seven minutes begins now. Go. Okay, leaders, I am going to go get the panelists. They're going to come back in for the readouts. So you decide whether you want to present or delegate. You guys want to come up? Okay. Leaders, are you ready? We have reconvened our panelists. So now we're turning the tables. So they're going to get to hear from you a little bit. We do have a strict time limit. Uh, so I'm going to keep you to your two-minute readout. And then I'm going to ask our... Can I have your attention? Shh. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the panelists to respond. We're going to call that a lightning round, and we're done, OK? So the process is as follows. We're going to have two-minute team readouts, where essentially what I'm going to ask you to do is just summarize. This was our element. We believe we have to do x, y, z more, better, differently. And some next practices we should consider are, boom, very much just the facts. What I don't want is, well, we had a really good conversation, and so-and-so likes windsurfing. That's not what we're, we're just about the facts at this point in time, given what we have to do. Who would like to go first? OK, Ben Walker is going to go first. And you're going to tell us your element, more, better, differently, and next practices. I say I'm not the leader. I'm just summarizing. You've already wasted time, my friend. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, uh, so what we do, must we do more of? Testing and prototype. What is your element? It's focusing on the few. So what must we do more of? Uh, test, more testing, more prototyping, um, and uh, having an effective strategic priority meetings. And what we mean by effective is ones that reduce the amount of priorities rather than add <laughs> to the amount of priorities. Um, what must we do better? More ongoing assessment, more communications, and better ideation uh, processes. And what must we do more differently? And it, it must, what must we do differently? Uh, speaking to Steve Jobs' thing is we've got to be a little bit more ruthless, more disciplined um, about stopping things that no longer work, um, and also limiting uh, the ability of one individual to continue to work on a project uh, that actually is not in the priorities of the organisation or its clients. Um, in terms of next, in terms of next practices, I'll get it in thirty. Um, we think. Clear ideation process, ruth on, ruthless ongoing assessment, all wrapped up in design thinking principles. Very good. Round of applause. For the well done. Next. Give us your element, more, better, differently. 
uh, how to catalyze the network. And actually, I'm going to, so it's catalyzing the network. Um, and, and we were all really poor at this, so uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. And I actually want to hand over the mic to two of our members on the team. So uh, one came all the way from Japan and had a very interesting take on implementing Western cultures. Okay, I think that the, uh, uh, the strength of Japanese cooperation was the informal network, actually the community within the company. So when I was young, uh, although I worked for marketing, but uh, I was assigned to a technology department or the manufacturing department to, you know, uh, know each other. That's very really important. So I knew almost everybody in business. So cross-functional team was easy to do. But when we adopted the Western style of management, such kind of culture and the community uh, deteriorated. So how we can um, establish something new is very important. And then we had another very radical approach, to me at least. Uh, John, you did something quite different. So, yeah, well, what, one of the things we found was when you refer to an operations team or a finance team, they all huddle together. And they all work together very nicely, and that's good, but it doesn't solve the problems that we actually have in the organization. So we've started getting rid of those concepts of teams, and instead we hand problems into the organization, and whoever is available, capable, and interested can naturally form a team around that problem to see what happens. It's not perfect yet. And the third observation relates to an article in the latest edition of Harvard Business Review uh, where they actually gave people uh, tracking devices and saw how the informal networks were actually mapped. And then they rearranged the formal setting of the office space. So um, it could be like Steve Jobs, he did when he designed the Pixar building, having the, the coffee stands and yeah, the drinking fountains and the toilets in the middle of the building. So that could also be a way of uh, um, encouraging cross-pollination from different branches. Three great stories there that talk about catalyzing the network. Who would like to go next? Colby. So our element was decentralizing decision making. Um, and we combined really more, better, and differently together. And we realized we need to be clear about the decision maker and what that means, what the responsibilities of that are, to create more of a common language in our organization around decision making. So whether that's a framework that we adopt or several frameworks so people are clear on the roles they play. Um, we have to generally create more psychological safety because we might have those things, but then people are scared to actually make the decision because the last thing we also need to do is better understand the consequences and are there such things as good decisions and bad decisions or are there just decisions that have impact and what are the consequences of those outcomes. Um, the, the practices were an idea of visualizing work that if we were in um, if we were in a manufacturing plant, it would be quite easy, potentially, to see where something's breaking down, but in the knowledge economy, it's hard to see. So how do we visualize the work that's getting done and the decision hurdles along the way? Um, creating more experimentation and rapid prototyping so we can make decisions and then quickly see what the impact are. And then increasing access to data and transparency or the matching process of getting the decision maker the information he or she needs in order to make the decision. Thank you, Gobi. Round of applause for that team. Okay, we're done on this side of the room, so we must move to this side of the room, and we have to go quickly because we need to hear from Rick before he exits stage left. So our element was giving others agency, and uh, what we thought we need to do more of was um, creating more entrepreneurial structures, particularly that encourage people to own the whole outcome rather than just a slice of the pie. Um, we need to create some clear constraints and guardrails um, so we know the extent of our responsibility, but we have freedom within those particular guardrails and constraints. Um, and leaders need to provide uh, backup and also make sure that learning happens. So then what we need to do better, there's something about rewarding collaboration. We talked about incentivization as well. We need to communicate better. Um, and then what we need to do differently is how we fund projects and, and the expectations that we have of returns on them. Um, funding, and then how we set KPIs and OKRs. Um, and then next practices, leaders need to ask. Um, so we had a couple of examples from, from um, our participants. One was um, in having more informal meetings uh, where there's constant reinforcement of the accountability that's given to the team um, and you know, encouraging the right sort of behaviors. 
And, the, and another example was um, ask, rather than the leader taking the decision themselves, asking their team to say, okay, so this is the situation, what decision would you take and why? Um, and um, getting more authentic uh, ideas from, from that. Johns Hopkins, which is um, a, a, a medical teaching hospital in the, in, the, in the United States, has the lowest mortality rates and the highest satisfaction, and they approach, they approach things that way, which is Socratic. They only ask questions. They don't tell what the response is. Last but not least. So our group was exploring embracing situational humility, and I'll keep it short and sweet because of time. <laughs> so I'll just mention our next practices that we suggested. So we thought, kind of like the previous group before us, that we need more informal conversations so that people are really able to show their true personalities and that will also help provide the kind of emotional level. Um, we also thought about kind of embracing failure. So a few companies that we know of, they do these failure nights. And it's a great possibility to show that failure is okay and really something that we can embrace and something that is celebrated in a way because you can get so many better practices from failures than just showcasing the best practices themselves. Um, we also thought that top management really needs to kind of showcase that they also fail and to highlight to employees, well, okay, if they fail, then we can also talk about our own failures and then show personal interest. So, yeah, that was our group. Thank you. Round of applause for that team. <laughs> Rick Goings, we promised to have you out by 520. So the floor is yours. Any response to what you heard, given your experience about how we advance people-centered transformation? Firstly, I think, boy, your takeaways were, were just terrific. Uh, so I should have stayed in the room and listened to most of your takeaways. To comment mostly about what I just heard last, too. And what, I'm, what I'm really thrilled to hear is the people side of, of this. Uh, Interesting too, I, I said uh, when I was with uh, Ricardo and his team in, in New York, they give you your, uh, they read your CV as your big introduction and all the things, your platitudes, awards, et cetera. And I really said to the audience that I really w ought to be, I did full disclosure, I said what they don't talk enough about is your failures, your face plants, your flops, because once you get by that, and I guess I'm older now and have more resources now, it's easier for me to spend more time talking about those because those are the kinds of things where I learn most. And I've tried to, in leadership position, create an environment where people could, in fact, fail, where the atmosphere at the organization, yeah, you play to win rather than play not to lose. And I heard that resonated throughout the, the organization out there so that when you come up with people that they take chances, you, you, you basically have an attitude that you design it, you launch it in a learning laboratory, because I always say learning laboratory because you're, you're allowed to tweak it if it's in the laboratory. Then what you do is you fix it and then you scale it up. Once people understand that's natural parts of it, uh, Every one of the ones I knew who were really great went through those periods, and I find they talk about it more. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a thrill to hear these kinds of things from you all. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Carolyn, Good. words of wisdom. Oh, you can use that. Yeah, go ahead. Take the Thank you. Okay, so um, great session this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, for me, it's the, the main key takeaway. So it's really about... Um, people and mindsets, so that's what was the session about, but that's mainly what we need to focus on. And this is on two dimensions, we need to have the right leaders and we need to have the right staff in the organization. And in order to achieve that, um, we do not have to fire everyone, so I think there are a lot of different possibilities to achieve that. And there are four dimensions I would like to highlight. So first of all, you can reskill your employees and reskill yourself, and that's very important, never stop learning, always be a student of life and, and learn and achieve your, um, advance your capabilities. The second one, um, you can redeploy also the tasks that you have in your organizations. Maybe the tasks, how you structure them, do not fit the future anymore and do not fit the competencies of your 
um, employees. So then you can think about redeploying it, taking it apart and putting it together in another way so that it makes sense for your employees. Then obviously you can also hire new people that bring a different mindset into the organization. And um, then finally you also have the possibility to get rid of some people that really don't want to change, but this is only the, the measure you shouldn't really take. I think you can do a lot with reskilling and you should really focus on reskilling your employees, reskilling yourself and be a role model. Just one more story on that when I did my interviews, like for one organization, the board member of a big large media um, company, they wanted to get um, uh, two or they, they hired people for a senior position and then they had two right, really great candidates and then they asked the two candidates, like it was the CEO position, okay, would you be willing to go, because they both weren't really good in coding, and then they said, would you be willing to go like three months to Columbia to do a, a, a training seminar on coding? And then this one guy said, well, yeah, you know, I, I actually I know everything, I don't really think that I need to do that. And the other said, yes, I would love to do that because I know I have, I don't know enough and I re would really like to do that. And then they said, the board said, okay, we're gonna take that one who's willing to learn because even if you are CEO, you still need to learn and you need to show that to your team. Thank you very much. Ms. Martin, words of wisdom on PCT. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the common themes seems to be uh, experimentation and tolerance of failure. I d wanted to um, <clears throat> share an idea on extending that. So I think if you replace the word failure by um, accidents, um, some interesting ideas emerge. So. You know, if you're successful, um, obviously it invites the conceit that, you know, what, exactly what you planned happened. You know, often success is, as, is more mysterious than failure. A lot of things have to align. So if you, if you treat your successes like accidents and you say, well, how did, how did the stars line up? And you trace back the causality, you actually, uh, there are richer, as richer learnings as with, a, with an experimentation system. Um, also, you know, you talked about prioritization. I, I think... Um, you know, companies have deficits, different um, pathologies of, uh, in terms of deficits of creativity. Sometimes it's an excess of ideas, you know, so you need prioritization. Um, so sometimes it's actually a, a deficit, in which case you need more divergence. And sometimes the answer is managerial, and sometimes it's, 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 it's anti-managerial. You know, sometimes it's more top-down divergence, more bottom-up divergence. So I think being specific about, you know, is our idea, is, is our organization hyperactive managerially, you know, hi hyperactive in terms of ideas or the opposite, and then designing the, um, the accident production and reflection system uh, appropriately is important. And then the final connection is one with diversity. I think, um, you know, if you think about um, either a plan or an experimental process, it seems like a very deliberate hard work process. <coughs> um, on if you look at the mathematics of landscapes, this, this is idea of a downward, a downhill move. A downhill move is something which is effortless because it's just natural to the people involved. And the thing about diversity is, you know, my mental landscape, we're looking at the same reality, but my interpretation of the landscape is different from yours. So my downhill move, what is trivial to me is not trivial to you. So I think cognitive diversity is very important in producing uh, a, an organization that never gets stuck on a uh, on, 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 a, on a local optimum. You know, two requirements basically. One of them is have cognitive diversity in the organization. The other one is keep it in motion. So, you know, keep disturbing it so that you don't get that sort of functional lock in that somebody over there uh, talked about. Cool. Thank you. Ruth. You next. So, one of the things that struck me as I was listening to your observations is the importance of stories and the importance of symbolism. And I don't think we talk enough about symbolism at an executive level. Uh, so what is a symbol? A symbol is something that has meaning in people's minds, regardless of its inherent substance. And I think every leader in the room has had this experience. You do something because to you it's just complete common sense. You know, you move people down the hall because they've got to be working together. And within, you know, 15 nanoseconds, the entire organization is up in arms because that person was supposed to get the next opening with a window and this person is too junior. And, you know, you just, you're astonished by the interpretations people make of, of what your intentions were. So I think um, it's, it's super important to pay attention to the meaning that you 
create in other people's minds. And I think the way that you do that, well, one way that you do that is through stories. You know, and uh, we, you, we heard a couple of them already today. Um, one of my favorite stories is about the early days of the Macintosh computer. And of course, Steve Jobs was a master at symbolism. And reportedly, he was upset with how slowly it was booting. And he said to the development team, you know, this thing is going to be used by tens of millions of people. And if you could get it to boot more quickly, it'd be like saving tens of millions of lifetimes over the time that people are going to be doing this. And I think that's a, just a, the kind of memorable thing that creates meaning in people's minds about what we're actually working on. Last uh, quick, simple example is uh, from Lou Gerstner, uh, who used this in his transformation at IBM. And he said about symbolic action, he said, you know, it takes an awful lot of feathers to make a critical mass of feathers. Uh, so I was struck not only by well, very interesting observations, but also by how our lenses may differ and capture different parts of reality, even for us as commentators. So I was thinking about that when Caroline was uh, giving her own description, uh, because her focus was in the role of the individuals when my mind was going exactly the opposite way. Uh, and I guess to, to some extent, uh, I'd like to say, to, to think about how we each come to that with our own biases uh, and preferences. And mine may be a little bit more structural, so I'll speak about the structural, not to discount the importance of individuals, but uh, building also on what both Rita um, uh, and uh, Martin were saying, um, I heard not about individuals that are the ones that are going to drive success or failure, but the context where individuals work mm -hmm. which drive success and failure. I do not, and that's a personal view, I, I think that uh, we may be confusing symptom and causes when we think that it's a problem of the individuals. I think we create the context whereby people make decisions, and the way that I read all that I heard is how can we create the right context to make the decisions that are going to be useful, i.e., what do we need to change so that people do the right stuff? And I think that, to me, this is quite important, and it touches on the danger of tribalism that I see rampant in society. And of course, you know, I, I, this, is, this is in politics and this is in business the innovators and non-innovators, the Brexiteers and the Remainers in the UK. Well, the question is, what do people do in different contexts? What are the decisions that we give them? And what I heard you guys say is, let's think about um, the principles that will allow us to uh, ensure that we take the right decisions. I heard a lot about the need for transparency. So pretty much all of the groups uh, wanted to have a more transparent way in which the decisions or the principles that are followed are taken. So that's one thing that cut across. The second thing that I heard was flexibility, i.e. the need not to take the existing structures for granted and be able to examine them. But again, this is not just examining people, this is examining the structures. And if someone is abusing the position, drawing on the structure that they're at, you can call them out. And uh, to me, that takes me to the uh, next meta level um, observation that I had that cut across pretty much everything that I heard, which is accountability. Uh, and I think that there is a, a desire for us to look at the um, accountability for why we're doing what we're doing and the possibility of discussing it and saying, well, hang on a minute there, the world's changing, uh, let's see what we're all trying to do as a group and let's find the best possible way of achieving it collectively. Now. To me, that raises a, a, a couple of further issues. The first thing is, how do you do that? And I think that this is where the comments of both Martin and Rita uh, sort of sounded very uh, um, complimentary in a way. You do that by not only explaining a rule book, but by translating it into stories that are easy to comprehend and that people understand by example, uh, by allegory, by um, uh, what can motivate them. Uh, and also you think about uh, what is the problem that you have to solve in a somewhat more sophisticated way, which is my, my way of boiling down part of what Martin is, uh, Martin is saying. It leaves one more issue, which to me is probably the trickiest issue, Martin alluded to that as well, which is the issue of the architecture, i.e. we need to figure out how 
the teams will decide what the remit is. There's an existential question here. What the heck are we solving? What is each individual unit going to do? How are we dividing it between the partly overlapping and partly collaborating units that we get? And this is where strategy meets organizational structure. This is where we have to have a sense of what the general purpose is and how the environment is changing to tie us all the way to the very beginning of the stuff that I was uh, speaking about and then see how do we match the organization in order for us to have the subunits, which can have all these wonderful properties that we said. But there is this architecting, whose principles I think are, are the ones that we <coughs> discussed, like the principles that Martin was saying, that I think that we need to think about. And it's exciting because this is where I think the current thinking is and how to match these two. Environment business changing, the way that we will architect the teams are changing, and that connects to the individual decisions made. All right.